afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh. Our next session is Writing Resistance of Battles and Skirmishes. We have with us today four extremely interesting and wonderful women, Meena Kandaswamy, Ali Kobi Ekuman, Mahua Maji, and they'll be in conversation with Rakshanda Jaleel. So um, I'm just going to give a short introduction on all four of them. Uh, poet, novelist, and activist Meena Kandaswamy's debut novel, The Gypsy Goddess, is based on a massacre of Dalit agricultural workers in Tamil Nadu. Um, acclaimed writer and poet Ali Kobi Ekerman, in her novel Ruby Mon Moonlight, examines the impact of colonization in mid-North South Australia in the late 1800s. Celebrated Hindi novelist Mahua Maji's novels, um, and you're going to have to forgive my pronunciation, Marang Goda Nilkant Hua, is that correct? Thank you. Uh, focus on the nuances of tribal life and the collateral damage of development, and they'll be in conversation with writer and translator Rakshanda Jaleel. They discuss the relationship between poverty and power. Ma'am, it's over to you. Okay, I understand we just have half hour, so we're going to make it short and snappy. Uh, very brief uh, by way of introduction, let me say that uh, there are the wars that we have read about in history, the great wars. There are wars that we get to know about as breaking news on television and so on. But then there are also these other wars that are happening virtually on a daily basis. Often there are fights for survival, there are fights for rights, and they do not get talked about. They do not figure in the collective consciousness. They sort of slip through the crevices of memory if they've taken pl place even in recent times. And they don't kind of find any place in the larger public discourse. I'm going to start with you, Meena. Uh, Meena has written this incredible book called The Gypsy Goddess. It's about the paddy farmers in Tamil Nadu, a state that eats a lot of rice. And so naturally, paddy cultivation is very, very important. And um, it's the year 68, is that right? And uh, uh, so you have these paddy farmers who are virtually bandhua mazdoor. They are bonded labor of the landowners. And it's interesting how the Communist Party makes inroads into, uh, into the state and kind of breaks the monopoly. I mean, I talk a little about this war. It happened as recently as 68. There was a large scale massacre and yet it's something that we don't really talk about anymore. Uh, it's not just about talking, it's also about who talks. Because I think if you look at the states, uh, Dalit communities or the backward caste or the self-respect movement or the communist movement, there's always the reference to kill win money. And in, uh, because it's remembered because in 1968, you have these uh, feudal landlords uh, headed by Gopalakrishna Naidu who burns alive 44 Dalit men, women and children because the village of kill win money is protesting and asking for higher wages. So very briefly, that is the story of the massacre. But also what's um, more disturbing is that, one, it doesn't get into any mainstream narrative. It doesn't get, nobody studies about it in school or there's no reference to it in the so-called mainstream. But it's also very disturbing because it's not just the feudalism that's the problem here, but it's about how the state police, what did they do, how they were hand in glove with the feudal elements, how the judiciary till the end uh, held that because these are gentlemen landlords, you know, a landlord who holds, a, uh, owns a car and holds hundreds and thousands of acres of land, this man is not going to kill people. You know, that's the kind of judgment that the High Court of Madras gave. So in each stage, you see, you know, a failure of the idea of the state, failure of the idea of justice. And therefore, it was important, you know, to write about it. Yeah, but the Communist Party was trying to sort of get traction out of this. That doesn't happen to the same extent that it happens in Kerala, for example. Uh, is that something you want to talk about? No, I think uh, the Communist Party in, in, in Tamil Nadu itself, uh, I don't think they were trying to gain traction out of Kilvin money because they were honestly, they were the only source at the time of any power to the people on the ground. So they were working irrespective of caste. They were trying to unite all these landless agricultural laborers, all these who were basically owned like slaves, you know. They first put an end to the practice of whipping which was really prevalent even in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, until the Mannarpudi uh, agreement was signed saying that whipping is not going to be done. There were very, a lot of very caste-based feudal practices. And I think it, it was the Communist Party that could rally around and you know, make these people together and as a united front to challenge both untouchability and feudalism. And I think that in some ways, the advent of the self-respect movement meant that the Communist Party lost out to a lot of its traditional audience and its associates. Um, let's come to uh, Mahua Maji. She's from the state of Jharkhand. 
and her work has been about uh, the Adivasis, the tribals. She has talked about various things. She has a very interesting novel called Me Boreshala. This is about Bangladesh, the war for uh, the, the liberation of Bangladesh, the creation of Bangladesh, and then right up till the 80s and the 90s, what happens in the newly created uh, state. She has also written another novel called Marang Goda Nilkanthua, uh, referring to uh, Shiv drinking poison as a result of which his, his throat becomes uh, blue with the poison he's drunk. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about Hindi because it's Hindustani in Hindi. And briefly, I'm going to talk about the people who don't understand it, I'm going to try to give a summary. Mahua, tell us that you have written a new novel about the Adivasi. Tell us a little bit about it. Namaskar. I'm a Hindi novelist, so I would like to speak in Hindi only. Marangoda. Marangoda Nilkant Hua. ये टाइटल है मेरे नॉवेल का जिसका अर्थ होता है जैसे हमारे यहाँ शिवजी ने गरल पान किया था विष पान किया था और दूसरों को उन्होंने अमृत पान कराया था तो उसी तरह से जो आदिवासी इलाके होते हैं वहाँ पर जो यूरेनियम यूरेनियम वगैरह की जो माइनिंग होती है उससे जो विष निकलता है रेडिएशन होता है उससे वो खुद विकलांग होते हैं और उनके पशु पक्षी उनकी भी नस्लें नष्ट होती हैं या पेड़ पौधे वनस्पति सब कुछ नष्ट होता चला जाता है और उस तरह से पूरे पर्यावरण को हम दूषित कर देते हैं इस तरह के खतरनाक खनिजों के माध्यम से तो उस विष का पान उस तरह के उस वहाँ के लोग करते हैं वहाँ का वहाँ के वनस्पति करते हैं और जिसका लाभ हमें मिलता है पूरी दुनिया को मिलता है अमृत के रूप में सस्ती इलेक्ट्रिसिटी के रूप में या हम उससे परमाणु अस्त्र वगैरह बनाते हैं तो उसी थीम को लेकर ये उपन्यास लिखा गया है और ये झारखंड पर आधारित है उपन्यास आदिवासी जीवन पर है उनके जो कल्चर है या उनका लाइफ है और माइनिंग के इलाकों में उनके साथ क्या उनकी दुर्दशा होती है इन तमाम चीज़ों को समेटे हुए इस उपन्यास को हम साफ के सामने रख रहे हैं। So briefly, she has written about the life in the forested heartlands of of India. She's talked about the daily battles for food, for fuel. She's talked about cheap electricity. She's talked about migration. All of these things, which are very vital elements of daily fights of survival for those who live on the fringes. She's also talked about the witch hunting from the state. She's talked about basically short-term development yes. goals, as mm -hmm. I understand. Now, all of these things, uh, let me just come quickly to you and then we'll sort of open this conversation again. This pretty much, I would imagine, finds an echo with the kind of work you are doing with the aboriginals uh, in Australia. Would you like to talk about this? Do you see a similarity? Are you familiar with the work with the Adivasis, the tribal people in India? Sadly, I think it's a common dialogue um, throughout the world. And I think um, even the recent massacre in Nigeria and the um, avoidance or the, um, the media just not even highlighting it um, sort of heralds that the issues of the past are still with us today. Um, I wrote Ruby Moonlight. It's a verse novel. Um, about a young girl who survives the massacre set in the 1880s of Australia. Now, in Aboriginal culture, the land is like a book and it holds many stories from the past, the creation stories and um, it also holds the stories of trauma. If you travel through Australia, and you've learned to listen true, you come to areas in Australia where tears just start falling from your eyes, fear arrives in your body, you can hear screaming, you can hear shouting, and you know that once, since colonisation, that an atrocity has happened here. There's physical proof too, down past Mount Gambia, there's still chains cemented into a cave where they would round up the uh, local Aboriginal people and chain them to the rocks and wait for the high tide to come in. So there's a premeditated long and cruel killings. Massacre may suggest 
uh, a short uh, killing with guns, guns I think is um, considered a shorter death than people sitting and waiting for the tide to come in to watch people drown. There's many different stories like that in Australia and I'm amazed with how many different ways the invaders thought to kill us. So, Ruby Moonlight, um, yeah. So, when I went back to uh, the mid-north of South Australia, where I had been removed from my family and grown up there with the Eckerman family, um, uh, who, who I love dearly, um, but that was where I grew up as a child. And children explore everywhere. We rode our push bikes everywhere. It was in the 60s and the 70s when the world was a bit safer. Um, we lived on a farm, so by the age of seven, we were all driving all over the countryside. There wasn't any police out there. Um, we went swimming in the local creeks before the creeks were all buggered up by farming. Um, and um, so going back after 30 years and going visiting those places, it was different, but it was changed because I'd just spent 10 intense years out in the desert with the grandmothers and the old people in my Yankandara family that I had, it had taken me a long journey to find. And I'd been at this refined, fantastic university of Yankandara, Pitandara culture in the, um, in the central deserts of Australia. So my eyes were adjusted in a different way and my ears were adjusted in a different way and my heart. And sitting there on this land that I'd known as a child, which was silent to me, now the book had been opened because I'd found my family, my traditional family and my culture. And so the story of Ruby Moonlight, which is the survival of one girl, the massacres didn't wipe us out entirely or else how can we be? Sure, we've evolved. I look different from my mother who looks different from her grandmother. It doesn't change the fact that we're family. But the book is still there telling the story of survival. And I wrote Moon Ruby Moonlight for the survivors who, who um, you know, through amazing odds, have continued to live in Australia. Now, Ali's story is a personal story of survival. She's been an eyewitness. She's looked at it from close. Meena, uh, you have uh, located your story in a historical background. It's the recent past. It's the late 1960s. Tell us how you look at resistance. Uh, does history give you perspective? Does, does it give you a distance? Um, and there are some el uh, autobiographical elements as well. I mean, the woman, uh, the old woman, for example. Yes. Who is she? Well, the old woman is just an old woman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I think... Um, telling the story of when money was important because my father is from Tanjore and he, I mean like, uh, and I, this is something I say in the book as well, he tells me that, uh, that uh, you know, he says maybe you had a diff difficult childhood but you never knew what hunger was, you know. This whole idea of where does your next meal come from, this whole idea of what are you going to eat and he's, uh, you know, like, he had to run away from there to, you know, kind of make a life for himself and uh, the many things that he would tell me as a child, like, how he would, uh, you know, like work with somebody who is taking care of an elephant or trying to, you know, wash vessels in somebody else's house. This kind of very hard, hardening childhood and telling me that he left to Chennai because, uh, which is itself not a big place, but still, you know, migration from Tanjore to Chennai because he said that at no point could I be equal to anybody, you know, all these landlords who own thousands of acres of land. And for me, it was in that sense very crucial to know what's, what's going wrong because you go to Tanjore, uh, you look at it, it's like paradise, you know, just Green acres of green, green fields, and you have all these beautiful trees, palm trees, coconut trees, and you're like, why would anybody leave that place? And then you realize that behind that place are all these cruel histories, or is all this cruelty, and then you hear about something that's very pivotal to the history of the place, something like Il Venmani, where all this supposed peace is disturbed. And I think for me, in that sense, it was quite in, important to, you know, write about this, because in one hand, you are, I am, very privileged, you know, like my parents are educated, I grew up on a university campus. And on the other hand, you know exactly where he comes from and what are the stories that, uh, that really rank to you, make the person that you actually are. And so it was important to, you know, go to win money and say the story. 
Okay, I've got the signal to wrap up this session. This was supposed to be an hour-long session and we've had to squeeze it into 30 minutes. But I can't resist one last question to Mahua. I want you to talk very briefly about the relationship between poverty and power, which you talk about in different ways in your work. And we were chatting earlier on and you were telling me how this comes up. Uh, in Gharibi or, or state power ka jo ek link hai, <coughs> uski baat ki jai. मैं अगर अपने स्टेट के बारे में कहना चाहूँ तो देखा जाए पूरे देश में हमारा झारखंड सबसे अधिक समृद्ध राज्य है क्योंकि यहाँ इतने तरह के खनिज संपदा पाए जाते हैं कि इसे सबसे ज़्यादा गरीब होना अमीर होना चाहिए लेकिन वहीं के लोग सबसे ज़्यादा गरीब हैं तो ये जो पावर जो है जिनके हाथों में होता है वो अपनी तरह से उस स्टेट को चलाते हैं जबकि यहाँ के आदिवासियों को बहुत अमीर होना चाहिए था लेकिन उन्हीं को उनके ज़मीन से विस्थापित करके आ, उनको गरीब से गरीब बनाया जा रहा है वो पलायन को मजबूर हो रहे हैं और इसकी वजह से वहाँ ट्रैफिकिंग की समस्या भी बहुत ज़्यादा है आपको पता होगा पूरे देश भर में हमारे झारखंड के ही लड़कियों को ले जा काम में लगाया जाता है और तरह तरह से उनका शोषण होता है तो उसी एरिया में जहाँ से हम पूरे देश के लिए मिनरल्स लाते हैं उस एरिया को इतना समृद्ध कराना चाहिए कि वहाँ के लोगों को बाहर न जाना पड़े लेकिन इसके उलट हमेशा जो पावर ने यही काम किया है कि वहाँ के लोगों को गरीब रखा जाए और उनके जो खनिज संपदा है उनका दोहन किया जाए और ताकि वो आवाज़ ना उठा सके वो विस्थापित होते रहे और वहाँ की ज़मीन से हम मनमाना ढंग से कोई भी काम कर सके तो ये एक षड्यंत्र ही है पावर एंड पावर्टी के बारे में जो बात वो कह रही थी मुझे लगता है ये सबसे ज़्यादा हमारे झारखंड से ही इसको आप देख सकते हैं एक दृष्टांत के रूप में वेरी वेरी क्विक ट्रांसलेशन शी इज टॉकिंग अबाउट झारखंड हर स्टेट वेर हर नॉवल रिसेंट नॉवल वॉज लोकेटेड बींग वन ऑफ द मोस्ट नेचुरली गिफ्टेड स्टेट्स इन द कंट्री स्पेशली इट्स मिनरल वेल्थ शी इज टॉक्ट अबाउट द मिस यूज ऑफ पावर एंड डेलिबरेट मिस यूज ऑफ पावर बाय द स्टेट she's talked about exploitation uh, or she's talked about trafficking especially of young girls who are sent out of the state to work as sex workers or maids or so, so on uh, she's also talked about what she's calling the state conspiracy uh, a conspiracy at the level of the state now uh, is there one very brief question maybe we can take just about one question make it really sharp and short So you're talking about homogeneity. You're talking about wanting to cut people from the same cloth. Who wants to take a shot? Uh, uh, well, I think uh, how do the marginalised fight the state structure? I think uh, if everybody has spoken about it in, the, in their own ways, you know, isn't it? Like uh, whether it's the Aboriginals in Australia that Ali was talking about, or whether it's the Dalit uh, landless uh, labourers. And I think at one point you have to actually open up and say this is a racist state, this is a feudal state. And this is a caste state because I mean, there's no point of all of us trying to be nice and saying the problems are with each other because, in in a sense, it's the state structure that allows this to you know remain in place and remain in force because it makes it easier for them. So I think at some point, challenging the state head-on becomes very essential for all protest movements. Uh, for instance, in the st story of Kiel Van Mani, where do you get justice? Is there any justice in the entire state system? No. Finally. Any kind of revenge, any kind of closure comes because of the Naxal Bari movement. So, in that sense, I think we have to start attacking the state too when it is guilty and culpable. Yeah. I think at this stage in time, many governments of the world aren't mature enough to ensure that this uh, past doesn't continue happening. My grandmothers always taught me that to heal the past, you must honour the pains. And I'm going to close with just these four lines. You cannot build an altar from our bones, lighting candles for peace, after torturing our village. The smoke of burning flesh is no longer sacred.
Thank you. I think that was very powerful. We don't really need any closing after that. And moreover, the signals to wrap up are getting stronger. So let's close this session. Thank you. <laughs>